team tonight, which is the loss control chapter. Now, every department's got a little different philosophy on how they handle loss control. Um, for example, I just had this conversation actually with my partner at work the other day. He had a guy on Spirit Lake Fire that was just flabbergasted that the fire department didn't stay after and didn't deep water the basement and then take plywood and seal up all the doors and all the windows that were broken and, and do all that work after the fire. They just basically left the house. We do some minimal things to help protect property. But essentially in this area, we leave it up to the, um, the homeowner, to the business or property owner to take care of a lot of those things. Now each department might do it a little different. If, it's, if you do it different, speak up tonight. Let me know if there's something different that you do. But um, for the most part, we go there, we control the fire, we investigate the fire, and then we return the property to its owner um, and let them figure out the cleanup kind of from there is the way a lot of the rural departments work just because of the workforce that we have. A lot of times we're using volunteers and so they don't have time to stay away from work or to stay up the rest of the night boarding up windows and boarding up doors and do watering basements and taking the water out of and all that extra work that goes into involved in that. Now it's a good part of customer service so your bigger cities, a lot of times they'll do that. They've got full time on staff um, people that can come out and take care of that and the next day they can help come take care of that and prevent any more loss uh, through that. Where, again, volunteer, rural areas, we don't have as much of that anyways. So the philosophy of loss control is to minimize damage to the structure. Um, of course, eliminate reignition. That's one of our embarrassing calls. It's a fact of life, unfortunately. Um, and it's not a rekindle. It's, it's just we didn't get all the fire out in the first place. So that's why it's embarrassing. Um, now, sometimes fire hides pretty well, so you've got to get pretty good at making sure you get back to where you've got no burn loss and where it's a clean area uh, when you're going after a fire. And that should be in the eyes of your experienced folks and your leadership that should be in there looking and say, yeah, I think we're good. Uh, and then doing either a fire watch or deciding, no, I think we're going to be okay. We can leave the structure without leaving somebody here for fire watch. And that's going to depend on the extent of the fire, where the fire was at, what materials burned. Those types of things are going to make a difference on that as well. Um, reduce the time to repair or reopen if it's a business um, or even if it's, if it's a home to be able to get back into that home. Obviously, it's going to be a stressful event for occupants. I know it was uh, when I responded down to my father-in-law and mother-in-law's house when they had a fire. Knew the address from Spencer Fire, get page to it. By the time I was able to get down there, <coughs> excuse me, the fire was out, but my mother-in-law and father-in-law were kind of beside themselves trying to figure out what the next steps were that they were going to have to do. Part of it was the investigation. Um, they were both smokers at the time and the fire marshal immediately went to improperly discarded smoking materials. Well, neither one of them smokes inside the structure. And so they said, no, that can't be it. And so through the investigative process, they finally figured it out it was actually a short electrical plug and not improperly discarded smoking materials. Not that it made any difference to the insurance company because it was an accidental fire regardless. But it made a difference to my father-in-law and mother-in-law because they weren't careless with their smoking materials. They only smoked out in the garage. That was one of the things that they always did. They never allowed anybody to smoke in their house and they never smoked in their house. So some of that can be part of that stress going on. And then we were able to go in and recover several photo albums that hadn't been only damaged by smoke, not by fire or by water. However, if we left them where they were, they would have eventually been impinged upon by water damage and it would have ruined everything that was there. So knowing where that stuff was and being able to go in there, that reduced the stress of my mother-in-law significantly to be able to recover those photographs and those photo albums to get those back. Um, it'll create goodwill in your community if you're able to get some of that stuff out. Even though you're in the middle of a big blaze and they say, you know what, I don't care about all this other stuff. There's one thing that I need to get out of it. And you hear that one thing that I need to get out of there. If it's possible, you should try and go after that. If it's not going to be a big danger to your, to your people or to your department to go after that. Um, we've had to physically restrain people. One I remember in my hometown, Dad talking about it. They had a donation box. It was a shoe box that had cash and checks in it that was donations for a church program that they were doing. It was everything that they had raised to that point. It was a pretty significant amount of money. And... This guy had to physically be restrained outside the homeowner because he knew that box was there and it was so important to him, he kept trying to go back into the house that was charged with smoke and charged with fire to get it out. 
once the guys got in there and they quickly found it and got it out there unharmed, pulled it out of the house, then that guy just sat down, relaxed, and that's all he cared about. Okay? I've heard of stories about uh, musical instruments that have been significant to that person. It's crazy, some of the little things that might not mean anything to us, we walk by and go, that's a piece of crap, I really don't care about it. But it's so important to that homeowner that they risk their lives to go back in and get that. So sometimes if you have that opportunity, sometimes when we get there, we don't have it. We don't have the people, we barely have enough to work on the fire and be safe at that, but sometimes we do have enough people we can go in. Case in point, our fire in Spirit Lake. It was a shed that was on fire, and there was, we had most of it extinguished at that point, but there was still some that we believed up in the ceiling. And before we went and started tearing the ceiling down, we started offering the homeowner and their family, let's go in and if there's anything that can be salvaged that is important to you, let's get it out of there. <coughs> and literally, they loaded three or four pickup loads of stuff out of there that was important to her. And they were glad they were able to do that because we were right on the cusp between one of those wintertime rainstorms that was switching to snowstorm and blizzard and then below freezing temperatures the next day. So all of our firefighting water froze on the floor of the residence the next day. So they wouldn't have been able to get anything out of that residence at all the next day. So helping them get that stuff moved out. Never heard more thanks from family and from the patient that lived there or the person that lived there uh, than when she said that was so great being able to just get some of those things that were important to me out of there and to be able to help out with that. So. That's what we're talking about tonight with, uh, with the loss prevention and trying to do some things that will help out with that. That will also help minimize some financial loss if you're able to get some of those things out of there. And it could be, it may not be stuff. It may be records. We had a hotel fire in Milford. The most important thing that that owner wanted out of there was that business computer. Before the water raised up enough from us spraying water on the building, and ruin that computer and that hard drive, he wanted that computer CPU out of there. No problem, fire wasn't anywhere near it, so we unhooked the CPU, unhooked the power cord, pulled it and brought it out to him. And that was a big thing for them. They had insurance for the rest, but they needed those records to show that financial loss and to be able to prove to their insurance the kind of things that they would need. So all of those things are things you have to think about when you're trying to prevent loss. <coughs> There's two types of damage that occur. There's the primary that's caused by the fire and smoke, and then we all know about the secondary results, and that's from our, our efforts. Okay? We don't intend to go in there and damage things, it's just a part of what we're doing. Water damages stuff. When do we need to put out fire? Water. Okay? We've got to get into certain windows or certain doors, and sometimes they don't always open the way they should under fire conditions. So we use forcible entry tactics. We break windows, we pop doors, things like that cause damage. Okay? Yeah, sometimes it's fun for us, but you also have to think about how are they going to be able to fix this later or how are we going to be able to take care of it later. Some things that we use, or two tactics to reduce property damage, is called salvage and overhaul. A lot of times you hear them used together. Salvage is defined as reducing primary and secondary damage. Essentially what you're doing is you're either gathering stuff up and covering up the tarp in the fire building, or there's other ways you can bring it out of the building if it's important enough like we've talked about. Um, and, and then even other ways yet that you can protect that property that's on scene. Overhaul is searching for any existing, hidden, or remaining fires after the main body is extinguished. So that's when the work happens, okay? The fun stuff's when we get there and the fire's going and we squirt the water and the fire goes out. Now what do we say? We've got to go to work, right? We got to look for the rest of that fire and we got to get that put out to be able to uh, make sure that number one, we're not going to come back, and number two, that if we do come back, the damage isn't going to be worse. The guiltiest I've ever felt in my life was over here on um, my street, actually, on Dam Road. Toward the end of it, there's a structure fire. It was a room and contents and a little bit more than that from a chimney. It was an outside chimney that started up. And then after it went up the chimney, it came in underneath the false ceiling. We thought we had it. There was a grand piano on the main floor where the fire was at. We had it covered with a tarp. We thought, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Had the legs of the piano up so that it wouldn't soak up water, and we thought we had it pretty well protected. We did fire watch for an hour or two after that, and then we left. 
And unfortunately, about 6 o'clock in the morning, we got tripped back to the same address for smoke coming out of the house again. And that time, the damage was much, much worse. Piano was gone. The tarp we had covering it was gone. There was a lot more structural damage on the inside there because we didn't catch it, that fire where it was still burning inside there. And that does make me think and makes me feel guilty about that type of stuff all the time. So I got, I've gotten better. I've gotten more insistent about fire watch. I've got some experienced firefighters. Now we don't need people to be sitting there all night. That's fine. I'll sit there. I'll take volunteers that want to sit there for an hour or two at a time and make sure that that's not going to rekindle. Because it's important to me that if we do have some stuff left over and we didn't damage part of the house and there's a chance that they're going to salvage that house, we're going to make sure that that problem doesn't get any worse than what it already was. So everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's gone back to a rekindle on fire, I'm sure. If you've been on a fire department very long at all, you've probably gone back for a rekindle. It happens, unfortunately. We try and catch them so that we don't. But that's the important part of overhaul is looking for and I'll even maybe cause a little more initial damage on the fire department side to make sure that I've got that fire out, especially based on risk. Okay? We poked a hole in perfectly good drywall on a second floor over here at West Oaks, which is a four-story condo building. And we took the extra step of cutting out the drywall to make sure there was no burn marks on the wall on that next level up. Did we have to do that? No, probably not. There's good firewalls between the floors. But I damn sure was going to make sure that that building did not restart and go to full alarm. Because that's a huge building and we have every department in the county in here to put it out. It's right in the middle of downtown. So there's some steps that you got to take to make sure that that overhaul is ready to go. Drywall, so. drywall repair is cheap. What's that? Drywall, drywall repair is cheap. Yes, <clears throat> yes. You can fix drywall reasonably and coming back to, to put out another floor or the whole building is a lot more expensive. Okay, so pre-incident planning can impact your loss control. And a lot of us, again, small rural departments, we don't do the pre-incident planning as much, but if you do do a walkthrough, ask about things. What is important that we save if we do have a fire here? What areas need to be protected? Do you have certain rooms that already have fire protection in them that we need to be aware of to prevent further damage if the fire should break out of here? Okay, you probably, do you have IT rooms in your banks that would be essential? Lance, with your IT department, if there's a fire, you'd want us to not put water in them, but to make sure that those rooms stay closed up and protected from smoke and water damage? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I do sprinkler Right above it. <laughs> there are other methods, but it doesn't turn on unless there's a fire in there, though. Right, so. I got multiple bags. That's, that makes a difference, but if you didn't have that stuff or it was a smaller business, they probably wouldn't have the redundancy as much or the backup as much, and so that might be important for them to think about. So, so if you go into a, uh, into a place, find out what would impact that loss control there. Not only what, we, what do we need to get out of there if possible or what do we need to protect, but if this place goes up, what are some special considerations for making sure the fire is out? Okay. I think I told you about the house over here on Lake Drive. Had three roofs on it. We didn't know that until we started working on it. If we go and pre-survey someplace and then we find out it's had a bunch of additions, we may need to, and we find out it's got three roofs, that'd be something to note. Because one fire could be hiding under one of the roofs so we don't get access to it and don't know that that fire is there. Okay? That drop ceiling in that house I was talking about earlier, that all should have been pulled down we should have gone into the insulation a little better and looked for that fire a little harder. Okay. Other things that you can look for, the most effective and least destructive means of access, maybe that's a Knox box. Okay. Fire departments can get Knox box keys for pretty reasonable and can start your program in your own town. I think I've showed you those before. Each town has them and that can be a way to reduce destructive means of access. Especially if they have just an alarm system. Okay, you go busting in their door every time they have an alarm, that's going to get expensive for them. If we have a key, we can unlock it, go check, shut off the alarm, and make sure that there's not a problem there. What's the most effective means of evacuating or protecting the occupants? Okay, 
we found out in that one building where we do have an ox box, there was a fire there, there was smoke coming into the building, and nobody evacuated. So that may be something we have to expect in the summertime. Even though the smoke alarm's going off, the people might not be evacuated. You may have to get forceful and get other people involved to help get them evacuated out of that building. Location and protection of vital business records, we're going to hit on that. When and how the built-in suppression systems are support, supported and used. So that would be is, do you have a, a building with a fire department connection on the front? You know what the fire department connection on the front is? Anybody see one? Okay, we have several buildings in here, apartment buildings. It's the, usually the one or the two, two and a half female connectors that you take a two and a half line from your truck and you help boost the sprinkler system in the building. It's called an FDC, is usually it's how it labeled in red, white letters. It'll say FDC on it, and that's where you make your connection to help boost your sprinkler system. If it's a big, if it's a single room fire and there's only one sprinkler head going off, <coughs> excuse me, that sprinkler is going to be able to cover that. But if that fire spreads and it gets bigger than what the sprinkler system can handle, you're going to need to add on your truck to that to increase the pressure to be able to. Uh, to be able to get the, all of those sprinkler heads running the way they should be anyways. And then how to protect the building's contents from smoke and water damage or your firefighting efforts is something else that you should work on in a pre-plan anyways as you go through there. So find out buildings with high value contents. Um, the Three Sons of Milford. They had a simple roof fire. They were working on the roof and the attic space where they store their spring materials had smoke in it from where they were working on the roof. It got through the roof line and got into their attic space that they stored all their spring material for. This was late fall, uh, early spring. Had a million dollars in smoke damage loss. Just like that. Just from a little fire that took them a half a gallon of water to put out on a roof line and then they evacuated the smoke out of there and had a million dollars in product loss or merchandise loss from that. So it adds up fast. Uh, residential occupancies and commercial occupancies, we're not going to pre-plan um, a lot of your residentials all the time because we won't have access to them. But your commercial properties um, and your high value content, a lot of times you can get in there and, and get a pre-incident survey done or basically results in a tour and making special note of some of these different things. I try and get out to as many of our new buildings as they build them. So I can see them in the construction phase and then in the final phase as well. And that helps us out a lot that way too. Learning objective three is determine appropriate salvage procedures. And four is to compare and contrast different types of salvage covers. So salvage again can, depends on what, if you got enough staff or not, to start right when you get on the scene. So if you have enough on-scene resources, you can do it. Otherwise, as the time allows or as the situation allows, you can start doing your salvage right away. There's different ways to perform salvage, and the choice depends on a lot of different factors, but there's simple things like cover the contents of salvage covers during operations, or delay in suppression to remove vital contents. So there's something really important in there that we're concerned about, we may even delay putting out the fire. They're saying, I don't care about the building. I just need this out of the building before we do anything. This cannot have water damage. It is essential to my business. It's essential to my home. It's the most important thing in my life. Okay? If that, can be, if that is something you can do reasonably while delaying suppression tactics, that's okay to do. As long as that person's there saying, this is what has to happen. Covering contents with salvage covers during operations, you can gather stuff in the middle of the room. It's amazing how much stuff you can get under a tarp pretty quick. Now, whether it's important to you or not, try and get as much of that stuff to the center of the room and under a salvage cover, and then they can figure out what's important to them later um, after the, the fire or the incident's over. A lot of times your insurance companies, if it was involved in the fire, they'll just replace it anyways nowadays because of the smoke. So, most of the time anyways. Some of the factors that are involved, whether you're going to do salvage or not, is the number of personnel that are available, the extent, the location of the fire, the type, the size, the quantity of the contents, and what the weather is outside. In Iowa, that can make a difference. 
So like in, the, in Square Lake that I talked about, rainstorm that was starting, but the winds were picking up, it was supposed to get colder and turn into a blizzard. So with those changing weather, it kind of helped us make our choice on how we were going to do that. So there's three main methods to protecting contents. One is moving the contents to a safe location in the structure. So if there's a place away from the fire area, then you can move them to that area. Removing the contents completely from the structure. If you do that, you need to make sure that the owner is available or has something available to be able to store that or make it safe to keep it from looters and other people wanting to pick that stuff up. Um, or protecting the contents in place. Putting them all in the center of the room or putting them all in one location of the room, putting the tarp over the top of it. Okay? So there are several things that you should understand. For the talk about the high point in the furniture group, if you gather stuff, try and create a high point so the water is directed to the ground and away from there. Um, and then furniture damage, if you can, try and get it propped up on something because even wood furniture or upholstered furniture, if there's water in the carpet, it's going to suck that water up into there and it's still going to end up with water damage through the wood and through the, through the furniture. I'm guessing like your wood in the basement the other day. Yeah, all nice and warped now, is it? Uh, I haven't even looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of waving flags. Yeah. There you go. It's an easy way to make it windy. There you go. Some of the things about commercial occupancies, um, it may depend on what they have in there. If the displays and shelves are built in, it may be hard to protect that stuff. I know they talked about with the floods and the bomb guard store at the one in the towns that they moved all the stuff up two or three shelves to try and get it out of the flood water levels. So that's one of the things that the fire department went in to help do pre-flood before it reached the building to try and keep that from all getting damaged as they moved it up two or three shelves in uh, Sometimes the contents are stacked too close to the ceiling to be able to cover them up. Um, and then if the stock's susceptible to water damage, um, you can still place it off the floor, but it has to be covered. One thing they talked about is bales of things, or large rolls of things like paper that can get soft on the bottom. So rolls of paper in an industrial type setting, they get wet on the bottom, they start to tilt one direction, they can fall, and some of those paper bales are in excess of a thousand pounds. Okay, if it's bales of paper or bales of straw, something like that, the only way to really get through that is to tear them apart uh, to be able to get that fire put out if fire has gotten to them anyway. And I think we talk about that later. So there's a lot of challenges that come to water and with water, and I think some people have uh, had those challenges recently with the melting and the rain and all the fun stuff that we had with trying to reroute water and clean up water in their homes. That's kind of the same thing we're doing with firefighting. Trying to reroute that water to cause the least amount of damage uh, is what we're trying to do during salvage operations. So we use the covers to get the water out into the floor. We just talked about the high piled stock a little bit. If there's large quantities of things, if you can, get them removed. Um, and then obviously just know that it could ruin finishes or it's most likely the water's going to ruin finishes if you run it off. <coughs> this is the assignment part that they talked about. If you're part of a volunteer department, it's just you get assigned to it. Um, in bigger cities, again, the latter or specially designed companies are sometimes assigned to it. They usually train all firefighters in it. And then usually engine companies carry the equipment. They're the folks with the water. Um, and so a lot of times they have the materials with them to be able to, uh, to do the salvage part of it or to direct the water. Anyways. There's different types and sizes of salvage covers. Um, Canvas, which I've got some of the canvas tarps over here. There's vinyl and then disposable heavy duty plastic rolls. All of those things work well uh, for moving the water away from there. Um, the poly tarps, of course, are flammable. So if you got any risk of flame, those aren't the best choice. The canvas helps keep the water off and keeps the flame off a little bit anyways. Um, and then the heavy duty plastic, of course, is flammable too. So. To maintain them, basically it's make sure there's not a lot of holes in them and then uh, scrub them off with soap and water and let them dry properly before you fold them and put them away so they don't get mildew in them. That's essentially what you do with it, especially the canvas tarps, you need to want to make sure that they're really dry before you fold them up and put them away because it doesn't take much moisture to get mildew going in a canvas tarp uh, as you go along. So there's lots of different tools that you can use. 
uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, general carpentry, mop squeegees, and buckets, depending on, again, how much your department does for salvage and overhaul. Um, so it's going to depend on how much of that stuff you want to carry and how much your department does to be able to have some of those tools that are in there. This is a good thing if you have sprinklers in your area, um, and it's something I've got to look into. Typically, there's a stopper. If they're, what's nice now is the companies that are installing the sprinklers are putting toolboxes in the sprinkler rooms that have these tools in them to be able to shut off an active sprinkler head if it's not activated for the right reason. Otherwise, it's a good tool to carry on the fire trucks to be able to do a water loss. Um, we've had a few of these where the sprinkler heads have been activated or things have been activated. We've had to shut the water down and then open the drain up. Well, even with that system, it takes several minutes for the water to run out and you can have an extra 50 gallons of water run through a sprinkler head and the time it takes to shut off the sprinkler and to open that drain to get all that excess water out of there. So it's a good idea to have something. These are some different tools that you can put in the sprinkler head to get it to shut off so it stops the water from flowing. This is just a common wedge that you can slide in there. Um, you can take two wooden wedges, the, the shorter door wedges that you sometimes carry, guys carrying their helmets, and put them together underneath the sprinkler if they're narrow enough, and that will help shut off the sprinkler heads to just something to stop the water or slow the water flow down until you get a chance to get the water shut off. There's a carry-all tarp where you can put all, a lot of your, your drywall or ceiling or insulation that you're pulling down. You can put that on that carry-all tarp and carry those items out and dump them in the yard. Um, they talk about floor runners. We used to have a couple of those. I'm not sure where they disappeared to, but um, I know one time we used it when Pelican Ridge was still new, our little build building area out here. And we had to go through some mud yards to get into people's houses. Well, they had brand new white carpet in their house on an EMS call, and we had to traipse through their new mud front yard and to get in there. Most of us were able to remove our shoes, but we still had mud that we tracked. We could possibly track in. So we had the runner, we laid it down their hallway, and they were pretty grateful about that, not tracking mud into the house to take care of the person that needed help. Um, Dewatering pumps. The dewatering pump is basically a sump pump. You just hook the long hoses up to it, run it out of the house, and you can drain the water out of the basement or low level of the house. And then your shop vac or your water vacuum is what they call it to help clean up any excess water that might be running on the floor. They talk about J hooks and S hooks in your book. Um, the J hook is one that you can just basically put into the wall and help hang your tarp up so that the water runs the right direction that you need it to. I believe the S-hook is designed to go over a door frame or a door so that you can hook onto that and use that to, to get your uh, water running in the direction that you want it to go that way. Okay. Learning Objective 5, explain ways to roll, fold, spread, and improvise with salvage covers. We'll do that in the skills portion here this evening. Um, we'll get a couple of things um, put together. We'll do a shoot and we'll do a, a catch-all and we'll do a couple of things with the tarps. Um, and we'll also go through a few other skills as we go through the night here. Um, ways to cover openings during salvage operations, we'll talk about that. So this is the one firefighter roll cover. If you fold it the right way so it has a split, you can simply unroll it and then pull it out apart. You can, and this is just so it's rolled this way. The problem with the roll a lot of times is it doesn't fit nice in the fire truck cabin. It's hard to get rolled that way and keep it rolled that way in the fire truck cabinet. Otherwise, you can do the same thing, except instead of rolling it, you can fold it. Then you can simply unfold it with one firefighter, and then you can pull each end and cover it up. Then you have the two firefighter folded cover, and that's where it's not folded quite as complicated, and you can simply use two, two people, usually put a wind up underneath of it, and cover whatever object you're trying to protect with the tarp down. <coughs> the folds are more complicated than what they need to be, but we'll go through them um, from your skills books here in a little bit anyways. Uh, removing water with chutes. Um, we'll talk about constructing a catch-all and splicing that where the chute can, or the catch-all can be spliced right into the chute and you can direct the water where you want it to go. The catch-all isn't hard to make at all. The chutes aren't hard to make. You can do it one of two ways. You can do it with pipe poles, which is the easiest, 
and gives you a little bit steadier frame, or you can just roll the sides of the tarps up and you can create your, your chute that way to direct the water the way you need it to. Um, and then the catch-all we'll talk about is just a certain fold on the corners that allows it to become a catch-all and, and works very well and can hold several gallons of water if you need it to. So. They talk about doors or windows or openings and roofs and openings in upper story floors, uh, basements and crawl spaces. So depending on if you do break windows or not, again, we typically around here are calling for the homeowner and they usually have a contractor or somebody that they work with or family that will come up and secure that building up for them, covering up the windows, covering up the doors. Um, if we do some roof damage, we do a roof ventilation. That is one thing that if I know the weather's not going to be decent, that we will try and get a sheet of plywood or something and throw over the top of that anyways to try and prevent more damage coming in the roof if it's at all possible. Um, but for the most part, around here, we leave that to contractors, but some departments, is there anybody, you guys do windows or doors at all after a fire? No? Doesn't look like it. So. Okay. Overhaul. There's some things about safety that we're going to talk about um, that you have to maintain. And that's kind of come into play just recently. It used to be after the fire was out and once the smoke was clear, ah, good enough, let's go in and get the rest of the work done. Okay, now there's some things that we should be doing the right way to help prevent cancer, to help prevent other problems uh, in our future from there. Uh, and then we'll talk about some factors that influence where the way it makes it difficult to try and find hidden fires. And we'll identify some different overhaul procedures. And then we'll talk about the thermal imager and how it can be used during overhaul. So overhaul consists of activities conducted once the main body of the fire is out. So the big part of the fire is out. We're clearing smoke out. We got a little bit of fire that we need to find where the seat of the fire was or where the bulk of the fire was. We need to chase after and find out how far this fire was and if there's any more existing fire there. So we've got to search for that extinguish and extinguish that hidden fire. And sometimes that's harder than what it looks. Depends on building instruction. So you got to go back to the first chapter, is it chapter four or whatever under building instruction. You got to look at that again. And you got to look at your structure that you're in and think about, okay, where could this fire have ran uh, with the heat and the smoke and, and where would that go? With what I know now know about fire and heat, where did this fire go? Did it go up into the attic? And where did it chase it up into the attic? Or where did we chase it when we did positive pressure ventilation? Where did we push it to? All things to think about with that. Uh, placing the building and contents in a safe condition. Part of that is also going to be determining the cause of the fire. I think I told you about the Spirit Lake fire where I had a disagreement with the firefighters that were there that were doing their salvage and overhaul. Okay? I said, this is the origin of the fire. Leave this area undisturbed for right now. No, that isn't where it started. It couldn't have, and they start tearing up the evidence there. Okay? Good thing we got pictures because then I could show where the bee pattern started and the fire marshal agreed that this is where the fire started. So work with your fire marshal or work with whoever's doing your investigation if it's possible. You gotta do what you gotta do to get the fire out. Don't get me wrong. You gotta do what you gotta do to get it out so you don't have to come back. But if you can, try and leave some of that evidence there, especially if you think there might be arson involved. Um, we had an arson fire just up the road here at Table 316. They have apartments above the building. The guy was pissed off at the landowner, so he took a flammable liquid, poured it on the carpet, and it was house, piled up some clothes, covered those clothes up with flammable liquid, and then he lit the trail up. Only problem is, is this flammable liquid wasn't burning the carpet very good. Whatever he was using for flammable liquid didn't burn very well either. So he had to relight it several places. I could see where he physically had to light a pile, it burned for a little ways, he had to light the next pile, it burned for a little ways, he had to light the next pile, it burned for a little ways, Started the clothes burning up, all they did was smolder a little bit, and they never got to the flame stage. When we got there, the first thing we saw was a trail of burnt liquid leading to a pile that was burnt. So I told the guys, go ahead and extinguish that fire, but try and not step on it and go over it. We ended up collecting that evidence and proved that there was flammable liquids poured on the floor there, and the guy got charged with arson later with that. So, I mean, it's it, look for those signs and try not to destroy those signs if there's evidence of arson or something going along there. So, that's been several years back. But. 
<laughs> Even a rookie like me at that point could go, yeah, somebody tried to pour some fuel there and start that on fire. <laughs> so it took, it didn't take very long to figure that out. So. Once authorization is given by two people, the incident commander and whoever's going to be responsible for the investigation, typically they're one and the same in rural departments. Okay? Unless it's a loss of life or over a million dollars or something like that, your fire chief is usually the one that's going to be in charge of the investigation. Okay? Unless there's injury, loss of life, over a million dollars, um, that is definitely looks like arson, that's when the fire investigators will come out. Now, some of them in the areas are really good, they'll come out regardless whether they get paid or not. But they don't get paid to come out unless certain factors are in place from the state to do the investigation. That falls on your fire chief or your incident commander to look at that for a cause and origin. And trust me, that can be tough sometimes when you're trying to look for the source of a fire on a completely destroyed apartment building or, or even a structure of some sort. So. A lot of equipment can be used during overhaul. Your pipe poles and hooks can be used to remove your, um, your drywall, either off the sidewall, mostly off the ceiling. Axes can make cuts into that, can help you get through if you've got plaster and lath. Prying tools, shovels, bale hooks, and pitchforks if you've got piles of stuff to get through. Uh, carryalls, buckets, and tubs. We have metal tubs in our fire trucks, and I know they get taken out pretty frequently, and I put them back in because they don't realize you can't carry hot burning stuff in a plastic tub out of a fire. Because then the bottom burns out and you look pretty silly carrying your shit out when it was a firefighter. So that's why the metal tubs are in the fire trucks. Okay? You can carry them out in your metal tub, dump them out in the yard, then you can put them out, or you can put the water out on right in the tub and soak it. That works sometimes really good as well. Power saws, drills, and screwdrivers to get what you need to get to, um, depending on what you gotta take apart. Sometimes instead of destroying stuff, if you can disassemble stuff, that saves them a little bit of money in the long run there. If you, if you can take a little bit of extra time and actually disassemble something and take it apart and put it out as opposed to just tearing it apart with your saws or your pipe holes or all that. And then your thermal imager can help you if you're well practiced with it and understand what the machine's telling you. Okay? You gotta walk around in it. You can find basic hot stuff right in this fire station, in, in your rooms, in your houses. Your ballast inside your fluorescent lights, if you have some in the structure, they're always going to be showing hot because they're warmer than the ambient temperature around them. you got to look for that difference in what is hot and then what is, it was just burning hot or on fire hot. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, especially with drywall, because a wet drywall or dry drywall, but especially wet drywall will carry heat for a long time and it's gonna give you a heat signature. So you gotta look and see, is this hot all consistent across here, or is there a different hot here than what there is here when you're looking through the thermal imager? So you have to use your thermals and, and work with them to determine what's normal and, and what's out of place when it comes to doing, using the thermal imagers as you go. So don't be afraid to go to the station, turn them on and walk around, okay? My favorite thermal story is we first got our thermal imager and we we're doing a practice burn in the house. And we turned in a corner to go into the room where the burn was going, and we're looking through the thermal, and we thought, who the hell's sitting over there? Somebody was on their knees in fire gear sitting right across from us. It was us. There was a mirror. Somebody set a mirror down, and the mirror reflected the thermal imaging right back at it. So we had to wave, oh yeah, that's us. It's reflected our, our view right back into us. So, grab a chair over there, sir. So, you gotta be careful with that stuff too. Windows can throw you off. Um, if you want, when we get the thermals out, look at the windows here and you can see a temperature difference because the windows will be cooler than what the inside of the station is tonight. Um, so you just have to be aware of that too. Uh, what's your limitations? There's different duties that happen during overhaul. The supervisor and the officer, um, if they're not involved directly in overhaul, direct the operations. The fire investigator, if on scene, will be involved in planning and supervising the overhaul. Typically, if your state fire marshal's there, they're not going to. Hold on a second. Hello? Uh, should be in the front black box. Yeah, there's a little electric battery box or something that should be in there. Okay. Yep. Sorry, we're looking for keys for the Pac-Man trailer. Mm -hmm. so. 
again, if it's a state fire marshal, they're typically not going to direct. They're going to say, do what you need to get done. Okay? But again, usually the fire investigator and the incident commander, the supervisor, the same person on scene in our small rural departments. Safety is the first thing that has to be addressed for overhaul. Um, you should inspect the premises, develop an operational plan, provide the needed tools, eliminate and mitigate hazards, and then monitor the atmosphere before you remove your FCBAs. Again, it used to be we'll turn the fan on, we'll get some air flowing in there. Looks like the smoke's pretty much out of here, we're going to go in. Okay, now what they're finding is, is that you should take your four gas meter, fire it up and walk through the building before you go and go off your FCBA mask and start doing the overhaul. <coughs> and you might be surprised at what you find in there. Okay? So with your four gas meter, there may be a couple of gases that show up. The big one is CO. There's still a lot of residual CO. If you're using a gas ventilation fan, you're actually pumping CO into your structure. Okay, those little gas motors you wouldn't think put out much, but the fan pulls it right through and pushes it right into the house. And it can fill it with CO to pretty high levels pretty fast, and that exposure doesn't do you any good. The other are some of the off gases that are um, produced. They talk about it in your book. It can be a high level of that in there, too. I'm trying to remember which one they say it is. Hydrogen cyanide. What's that? Hydrogen cyanide, yeah. So that'd be another one that could be a, a potential killer. And if you're breathing that stuff in, that's what causes the cancers. That's what causes the problems down the road. So you should you get fired up your gas meters, walking through with that, and until you get a reasonable uh, level, you should be still wearing your SCBAs. And even if you're not wearing your SCBAs, you should be wearing like an N95 mask. Okay, so you should be wearing some sort of mask of protection for the particulates that come down, especially in these older houses with this older style insulation that's going on. So something else to think about too. So yeah, smoldering toxic gases are a significant threat to firefighter health. Until it's proven safe, wear your gear. You're going to be in a culture, and I'll admit, I was part of that culture problem for a while. You're going to be in a culture and you're going to say, oh, Christ, it's fine, take your mask off. Just get to work. Okay? I was that way. I got called out by one of my firefighters once. Okay, we're working a fire yet, still a little bit of smoke in there, but he'd read the standards and understood this better than I did at the time. The firefighter called me out and said, hey, that guy's in there without a mask on. I said, yeah, and? And he got pissed. Well, there's all kinds of gases still in there. Well, I just didn't know what I didn't know at the time. But he was right. I should have said, no, hey, come out, get your mask back on, let's work this with a mask on. And so you gotta change that culture in your fire department if you're the new guy, it's hard. Okay, if you're the new person, it's hard to say, no, this is the way it should be done. We should be wearing our mask. I'm not getting cancer. Okay, and then remind I see, hey, this is not a good idea. We should be still wearing masks while we're working in here. The, um, the trains that you go to, the firefighter and cancer awareness, will open your eyes. Yes. Yep, the, there's a lot of information getting put out there on the firefighter cancer network, is it, or something there is that you can go to, too, so. But it's there. Some other, other hazards that you can run into for overhaul uh, is weakened floors from fires. Uh, if there is a weakened area or something you're worried about, mark or barricade it, make a visual thing. Okay, because even though you say this room is dangerous, the floor is pretty much burned out, doesn't mean somebody's not paying attention and goes walking in there and gets hurt because they fall through the floor. So make sure and try and mark those areas. Obviously, we deal with broken glass, nails, and sharp objects. Um, there can be cuts, punctures, or thermal burns if you're not wearing your gloves. Eye injuries are high on the list. Okay, we don't continue to protect our eyes. We don't have that mask, and that pull down is not enough. It should be the goggles or some safety glasses that you should be wearing if you're working inside there. Strains and sprains uh, can, can be helped through conditioning and practice. Okay, I wasn't doing a lot of the work you guys were on Saturday, but I got a strain and sprain in my elbow. Okay, I still can't go straight out. That's as far as I can get it right now. So, but. and I wasn't working as hard as you guys were, so I just jumped around the fire trucks. So. Uh, fatigue. 
you are more susceptible to injury. So after you get the big adrenaline rush and you put out the big fire and then you go to work and it's like, oh yeah, I forgot, this is a sucky part of firefighting. You go to work, you start to get fatigued, you start to get tired, that's when you can get more injuries or you're more susceptible to injury as you go. Charge hose line, there should be at least one when you're still doing salvage and overhaul. Because you never know when you're going to poke around that corner or open that wall and there's going to be full on flame behind it. It's happened more times than once when I heard a scream out on the radio, We need that water back in here now! Because that fire is building back up in a corner somewhere or behind a wall that we didn't catch right away. So you should always have a charged line ready to go. Just be aware when you're in there though, have nozzle control. Or have somebody on that nozzle and outside the door so that if it is leaking water, you're not causing more damage. Make sure your couplings are tight and not spraying water all over the place. They talk about a 100 foot front section on your hose. Not a bad idea. On your cross lace, then you don't have a, typically a 100 foot of hose is going to cover most everything inside the house. You're not going to have a coupling at 50 foot to drag inside the house with you. So if you have a 100 foot first section on, that works good for that. I don't know many that do, I know we don't, but it sounds like a good idea, or a reasonable idea. It makes a lot of sense. Plus, you don't have anything to catch for that first 100 foot on a doorway. So, it makes sense to me. Still have to work in teams of two. Two in, two out. That's the rules. Even though it might not be the ideal H environment or immediately dangerous to life and health that it initially was, it still is an environment that could be that way. Keep awareness of your exit, exit routes. And if you have a RIT or RIC team, a rapid intervention team on scene, you should keep them active until the end of the event where everybody's starting to go home. Rehab, okay? Everybody, every firefighter's favorite thing. It works well. After you burn through one or two tanks, whatever your policy is, you should sit down and rest, drink eight ounces of water, get your core temperature down, and work through that. Okay, we all get that Superman mentality from time to time. It's like, oh no, I can keep going, I'm fine. You're gonna end up hurting yourself. Okay, firefighters are gonna start overheating, get rhabdomyolysis, which is the thickening of your blood essentially. Harder to pump makes it a lot easier to get a heart attack and a lot e harder to get you back from a heart attack. So make sure and just be aware that that rehab is a good thing. Be aware of hidden gas or electrical utilities, okay? Um, sometimes you can go in and fight a fire with the utility still on. That's fine. Just remember when you go to do overhaul, if they're still on, that there still could be live wires in the area that you're going to be working at. Okay, we hit a fire on a dehumidifier. Electricity was still on, nice shower of sparks when we hit it, got the fire knocked down, backed out, pulled the electricity, went back in and did our salvage and overhaul. That's okay as long as that risk is worth that benefit as you go through it. And then continue to use an accountability system. Whether it's two tags or three tags, I don't care how you do it. Just make sure you keep accountability of your people as they go in and out of the building and arrive in and off scenes that you're able to take care of. <coughs> for before searching for hidden fires, you've got to think about a couple things. One is the intensity of the fire. How much structural damage is there? Okay, if it was an intense fire, can we really go in and do we really need to go through this or do we just need to keep an eye from the outside because it might be a collapse issue that we have to worry about? And the amount of water used, how much weight, additional weight was placed on the floors and the walls. Water can add up pretty fast. It's amazing how much six or eight inches of water sitting on a wooden floor, how much weight that is. Okay, and how many gallons of water that can be. So you go in there and you get all that extra weight and you add another 200 pound firefighter on top of that, that could be all it takes for that to be a structural collapse for you. So just some things to think about there. Things to look at for loss of structural integrity, weakened floors, spalled concrete, um, weakened steel roof members if the walls are offset or if they're leaning, not a good idea to be in that structure. And then weakened roof trusses are all things to be thinking about and looking for that would indicate that you have some structural integrity, prob integrity problems. Um, if there's mortar in the wall joints that's been opened up, the wall ties are holding veneer, or curtain walls are melted, heavy storage on mezzanines or upper floors, water pooled on upper floors, uh, and large quantities of wet insulation are all indications that um, there might be some loss of structural integrity. 
Four things to look to do when looking for hidden fires. Sight, of course, look for them. Now, when you're in a wintertime firefighting, this can be tricky sometimes. Is that humidity steam coming out of there, or is that white smoke coming off of something burning? It's hard to tell sometimes in the wintertime. Touch, you know, if it looks like a hot coal, I don't think I'm going to go touching at it, but you can certainly use your thermal and determine maybe touch, is this hand warmth or is this um, warmer than that? So start with your glove on and then kind of move from there, obviously. The sounds. Fire makes a specific sound a lot of times if it's still burning. You can hear it crackling behind the walls or sometimes you can hear it steaming as the water drips onto it. Things to listen for as you go over the lanes. And then your electronic sensors like your uh, rip kit or your uh, thermal imaging and tick cameras are things that you can help to locate hidden fires. There's also temperature. Um, guns out there that you can use to determine what temperature certain things are as well. Sometimes they come into handy as well for locating fires. <coughs> so as soon as the order is given, you should probably try and get in there and do your overhaul procedures. Um, try and determine the path the fire followed. And then follow that path until you find a clean stop. Okay, you're looking for insulation that's no longer burned or there's no darkened or charred floor trusses there, or darkened or, or charred wood, and we can see clean wood behind that. Those are what we usually say is, is it clean or is it still dirty? If it's still dirty, we keep digging out walls. We keep going until we get clean. Clean insulation, clean wood behind there, that indicates that there's no more fire, there's no more embers back there. Okay, and we dig out, we go down the same line as the fire, and then we go above, because we know the fire and heat and smoke go up. Okay. Typically there's a V pattern to fires. So you can start and you'll see that V pattern. Okay. So it'll start at the base and then it'll spread in a V out away from the fire. And you can actually follow that as a source. So if the bottom of your V here, that's where your fire started from or at least where it came from. So if it came from the basement, it may start here and then it's going to spread in a V pattern this way. So you need to follow both sides of the V here and to here to find where your extension is to continue with your overhaul until you get to the clean areas. If the floor beams are burned at party wall ends, you need to flush the voids with water. Um, and then insulation has to be pulled. You have to pull it. Sometimes it's the nice uh, paperback stuff that you can just kind of roll out of there and pull out of there. Most times in the areas that we live in, it's what? The old wadded up newspaper or blown in insulation it makes a hell of a mess when you get it out of there. That's where your buckets and your tarps come in handy. Get that out of there until you get to the clean stuff again. Um, and that's what's going to hide your fire most of the time is that insulation. Okay? It's going to drop down in underneath that insulation. That insulation is going to hold that heat in there and that's where you're going to get your rekindle most of the time is under insulation. They talk about not making random openings. Make sure that they're smart openings, that they would be the next step for that fire to go. Okay? This is where the fire might go, so we need to open up there. Know that basic building construction in Chapter 4. Search in concealed spaces. Um, and then consider if that concealed space might be a utility closet or a utility area. Because fires will chase utilities, too. Okay? They'll chase wires. Try and make openings in a neat plan manner to reduce damage. Open ceilings from below. Obviously, though, when you're pulling the ceiling, don't stand directly under where you're pulling the ceiling now. You're just asking for an injury there. Okay? Stand clear of any falling debris. Again, it shouldn't happen as soon as you can. Usually, small burning objects are frequently uncovered. Large smoldering items like mattresses and things like that should be taken outside to be extinguished if you can. If you're not going to spread the fire significantly throughout the rest of the house, it's just smoldering. Get those objects out through a window if you can, or if you can't get them out through a window, get them carried out to the outside front lawn and get them taken care of outside. If you think there's evidence of something, try not to disturb it. Again, you have to do what you have to do to put the fire out, but don't disturb it if it's evidence. Um, and then they talk about wedding agents, okay? Class A foam. That helps soak in that water into those areas, reduces the surface tension of water allows you to 
get that wetter water, if you will, to put out to the fire and soak into those areas to get a little better extinguisher for you. Okay? Thermal images, they have benefits and disadvantages. We've talked about some of them anyways. Um, so some of the ways that can be useful is to find those hidden hot spots and fires, but sometimes the fire has that residual heat, so it's hard to tell the difference between what is normal hot and then what is overall hot. Sometimes it disguises those hot spots. So don't let it be the only tool that you're using. Use those other senses along with that, but you can use that, just use other tools with it to make sure that what you're looking at makes sense anyways. Okay? So, loss control is an important component of your delivery with the philosophy of minimizing secondary damage to structures and their contents during and after fire control operations. Um, there's two, they're two of the most effective means of loss control. So if you can, try and gather stuff up. Again, we're a small role. We usually don't have the manpower or the power to do that, or people to do that, excuse me. But if you can, take the time and try and cover up some personal belongings. If the homeowner's there and has one specific thing in mind that's very important to them, if you can work on getting that out, get it out for them. Because that's the thing they're going to talk about. Even though their whole, you know what, my whole house burned down, but I told them I wanted that one thing out of there, and they went and got it. Those are the stories you hear about. I didn't care about the rest of the house. I wanted that one thing. Okay? Whether it's, you know, mom or dad's ashes or it's something sentimental to them, getting that one thing out. If it's possible, that's what I look for to go do is there's something in there. And usually when I get the homeowner on the phone, if, even if we're in the middle of the fire, hey, is there anything that you have to have out of there? And that's the things that we go for. And sometimes there's people, I, I don't know, I can't think of anything right now. And then there's some people, yes, I mean this, this, and this. Can you get that out for me right away? And that's what's important to them. So that can make a big difference. Protect valuable contents and structures affected by fire, as well as searching for hidden fires so that you don't have that embarrassing rekindle call. Um, and they talk about customer service oriented approach to loss control that makes sure that the citizen's property is adequately protected and the reputation of the fire service is held in the highest regard. Again, it depends on what you have time for and what your philosophy and policy is in your department as to what you can and can't do. So, we're going to go through the different skills here. We're going to roll the salvage cover for the one firefighter. We'll do the fold for the same. Um, we'll do the two and spread the two as well. We'll construct a water chute without and with pipe poles. We'll do a catch-all. Um, we don't have any way to really locate and extinguish hidden fires, but that's kind of it for the lecture for tonight anyways. I'm going to have a couple different areas going. Um, this is our four gas meter. This one just happens to have a pump on it. So to review it real quick, you just have to turn it on and just go through a series of checks with the ones with the pumps. They'll usually have you check the pumps. And so when it tells me to get ready to that point, I just didn't hold it long enough to get it going here. If you have an industrial scientific plan on at least two or three minutes to get it fired up when you're getting on the scene. And you should do it in fresh air. So if we're going to check this area, we should be outside in fresh air where we know it's not going to be an issue. So pump test tells me to block the inlet. So you just cover a bare hand over the top. And it's going to tell me to unblock it and push the button in the middle. And then it's going to start going through its own testing. And then you'll get a reading. Now these should be either bump tested or calibrated on a monthly basis. And it gives you the, the four gases. It gives you O2, um, CO2, hydrogen sulfide, and LELs is what the four gases typically are in a four gas meter. You can get a five gas meter too. So... O2 is important because it should be at that 20.9%. If there's, if it's below 20.9%, that means there's another gas that's overtaking the oxygen, and that's something you should be concerned about. Okay? If your CO2 is above 30 or 35, that's when your home alarms go off. Now OSHA says at 30 or 35, you can have about an eight hour exposure to that, um, that level and still be okay. 
Once it gets up to that 100, 200, and 300, at 300 you've got about two or three breaths and it's going to start affecting you. You're going to start having a headache and you're going to build up a level pretty high pretty fast. Okay? Um, I am honest, I don't know the hydrogen sulfide levels, uh, but the LEL I believe is between 3 and 9% maybe. I thought it was like 20. Could be. No, but between 3 and 9%, right at 7 in my house. Yeah, I can't remember what the explosive limit is. Anybody know what the explosive limit is right offhand? 17 through 22. 17 through 22. There you go. I knew there was a. That sounds right. So, because I know we were we were at the explosive limit on that garage. Yeah. We had a gas line inside a garage. We got hit by lightning. It was that CSST, that flexible gas pipe, and it was that got hit by lightning and had some pin holes in it. Was leaking in the garage. So then that was at an explosive level when we, what's that? It was a 21. 21% when we went into that garage before we started mapping. So there's the four gas meter. <coughs> I don't know what kind of thermals you have. It doesn't matter as long as you know how to use them. Uh, we have bollards here. We have the a couple of the T3, or we have T3 and a couple of the eclipses um, with the thermal throttles on there. What I've set up for you in a drill is at the end room out here, is I've got one hot spot and I've got uh, a couple of cold spots. What I want you to do is just with your, with the room dark without turning the lights on, I just want you to go in and look around the room for the different hot spots and cold spots that are in that room um, and just identify them and find them anyways just to see. Um, they should be pretty obvious, the hot spots and the cold spots. You may have to move around to see them though. Um, and then I want you also just kind of look at the windows back here as you go uh, for the thermal. And we'll do those two things first with the, the gas meter and the thermal, and then we'll come out and do some tarp folding and stuff. So, again, bathroom through this door, second door on the right. Um, otherwise, we can, I've got three thermals, so three of you can go at a time and look if you want, and we'll 